This is the Cop Thing Podcast, where we answer the question, why do the police do what they do? I'm the host, Brian Casey, and my guest is Kyle Keller. I was going to say therapist Kyle Keller. Um, and uh, just quick say that Kyle is with Ellie Family Services, and we'll come back to that. And this is the topic. You ready? Panic attacks. Yeah. You, you like that topic? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, th the reason I like that topic is I know that police officers have panic attacks. I don't know if you, that's even the right term, maybe anxiety attacks. That's the way they often describe it, panic attacks. Um, and it's really a frightening thing for them, both maybe experiencing it and I suppose once they have them, kind of fearing them. Yeah. So I was hoping we could talk about that and what that might be all about. Absolutely. And yeah, I, w I would just note actually that some people do distinguish between a panic attack and an anxiety attack. Um, oftentimes anxiety attacks are uh, racing thoughts, can control your thinking, being overwhelmed by 10 different thoughts happening at the same time, and that being really overwhelming. And then a panic attack is more of an acute, sudden experience of terror, really. Um, like you said, very frightening. It can feel like a complete loss of control um, or losing consciousness, like vision starts to narrow in, um, going crazy or about to faint. Yeah. Those sorts of things are, are pretty characteristic of, of panic attacks. Um, so there's a little bit of a difference, at least in, in some perspective. Perfect. Well, that's, that's good. So I'd actually like to uh, provide some opportunity for to describe both of those, maybe what you might think or like uh, say you have a client and you start to talk about that. Maybe some questions you might ask them to differentiate them or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so Kyle is a therapist that works for LA Family Services. And um, let me just explain to the listening group that uh, at the police department where I work, um, 630 sworn, so you get an idea about the size. The model that our agency uses for behavioral health resources, in addition to their just regular health insurance, um, uh, we have a number of therapists that are in private practice that we take under contract, meaning uh, they don't, they're not embedded within the police department, but they... Um, we take them on a contract so I can send officers there. And LA Family Services is one of those groups. And I'll just say LA is E-L-L-I-E. -L -L -E. And the reason I make that distinction is I've talked to officers, hey, I think a good fit for you would be LA Family Services. And they think it means L-E, like the letter L, the letter E, for law enforcement, which is not what it, not what LA is. However, it fits because you are a group that work with public safety workers and my thought about that is um, therapists that are skilled and good at their work, in addition, are, we might say, culturally competent to work with police officers. That's not a big group out there for that. Mm -hmm. So I personally am very grateful for that. That this, this uh, that's something that you guys do in addition to other things you do. So, and also a little interesting is, most of the therapists that I uh, uh, that we work with are female. It's a female-dominated field, right? Yeah, obviously, absolutely, yeah. obviously. But yeah, and um, so what? what so, so how did you end up getting into that field? And and what was it like? What's it like being a male therapist? Is it a big deal or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember the statistic, but I think it's like seventeen or twenty percent. But I could be completely wrong. But it's definitely predominantly females that are in the profession. Um, I started in the field i actually went to school at umd duluth um started in a pre-pharmacy program and um i just it, i wasn't um it didn't particularly connect with me and i'd always liked psychology um and started working in a group home when i was in duluth and that's when i got experience working with people that had pretty intense diagnoses like schizophrenia um, bipolar, um, and then came to the Twin Cities and became a case manager, a social worker working in in and out of the Dorothy Day Center, uh, Mary Hall, lots of Earth's facilities and other pretty high intensity places. Um, uh, got a master's degree, went to uh, work at the Walk-In Counseling Center, which is a really good resource for kind of crisis brief counseling. Um, and then yeah, I got my degree and then worked at Dakota County on the reentry assistance program, helping people actually transition from prison um, back into the community 
and got a chance to work alongside corrections um, during that process. And then started doing psychotherapy. And in terms of working in this area, um, really part of it is kind of random. And then Aaron Pash, the other owner, um, has worked a lot with police officers and um, just emergency responders or first responders in general. Um, and then I would get some of those as well. And just sort of over time, you kind of learn um, learn more about the profession and how people think and how they approach things. And so that's kind of the gist of it. I think if that answers the mm -hmm. question. Yeah. yeah. So, and then what do you do now at LA? What's kind of your responsibilities? Um, at LA, I'm the chief operations officer. So I oversee all of the administrative side of things at LA, um, human resources, technology, um, yeah, compliance, all the fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, but you, do you still see clients? Clients? Yeah, yeah. I still, I still see about five, five people um, here and there. And then I do do wellness consults yeah. um, for the departments when those come up as well. Right, and we're working on that right now. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll. That would be another podcast. Talk yeah. about, and that would what we're talking about there is that uh, I think it started with the twenty first century document. Uh, law enforcement, you know, 21st century policing document and the sixth pillar and that initiative about annual wellness checks. Um, and then um, how do you apply that in real life to agencies? And you have experience with that and, and I do now as well. So, yeah. all right. And then, um, and then just, uh, I was gonna just mention since I brought it up, they, the, um, I make a lot of referrals all day long for cops to see, uh, therapist and uh, I, I've noticed, um, I don't know if there's much, what do you think of the male female thing? It seems like most, a lot of cops, men cops, I don't know if they have a strong opinion on it. Um, have you, do you have a thoughts about that? I don't know if I've seen a, any sort of pattern, but everybody tends to have, most people tend to have a preference, but sometimes they, there's an advantage of having same gender of yeah. working with somebody you feel like can relate to, but then other times people would rather confide in somebody of the opposite gender. So there's not, um, there's no real pattern with that, but it's definitely good to have options. Um, and something that we're trying to, we try to be mindful as well. We actually, I know that we do have more male providers than statistically the field yeah. does in general. So, um, obviously you want to be able to provide people options and choices, um, and then have providers that do all sorts of different services like family therapy, couples, systems work, and individual. Well, and that's one of them. So when I say we have therapists in private practice, uh, at our agency we have nine right now, but two of them are therapy groups, or actually now three are therapy groups, so rather than just individuals. And what I like about that is I have a, a range of services that I'm thinking is available from f uh, financial counseling to marriage and family to substance use disorders to anxiety and depression, the trauma work, um, what else am I missing on the big categories? And and it gives me uh, a lot of options on, rather than I just have one provider that somehow magically is gonna be skilled in all those areas. Yeah. And then what's nice about Ellie and others like, well, especially Ellie in particular, is uh, just the range of resources that you have. Yeah, yeah, and, per, and we have multiple providers that do similar services um, and the advantage there too is that the relationship is the most important part. So it's we try to connect people with someone they're likely to have a good relationship with because if there's not trust there and a connection, then the rest of it doesn't really matter. So if an office, so let me get to the back to the pan, thanks for that. Let me yeah. talk, let's get into the panic attack thing or yeah. anxiety attack. So if, um, if let's, maybe this would way to frame it is if you were seeing a, an officer for the first time and the first thing that they, why just set up the appointment or whatever, how the conversation started, like they said, I had a panic attack or I had an anxiety attack, or I'm not sure what happened to me last week, but it scared me. Mm -hmm. What kind of line of thinking do you follow? Um, I would want to know a lot more about like when, where, who, what, um, all the details, the context, what the situation, what the situation was. And then what were the, when somebody says panic attack, what do they mean by that? Yeah. Um, and there's usually a lot of physiological things that people report and sometimes that's what they, um, that's how they experience it is more the racing hearts, difficulty breathing, pain in the chest, um, trying to think of what else, sweating, shakiness, vision problems or narrowing vision, tunnel vision. Um, I'm sure there's more that I'm missing there, but oftentimes people report those physical things. And then I would say a, a good disclaimer is 
because those can overlap with actual health conditions, it's always good to rule out any sort of medical concerns. But sometimes people will already go that route. They end up doing medical first. And then a, a physician says that there's no heart problem, there's no physical cause to it, then you sort of can rule out that it's, it's not a medical concern and that's when it becomes more of a mental health. Which is a good reminder because um, um, often if, a, if the listener is thinking, you know, I've got some concerns about my mental health and well-being uh, or they have concerns about their physical, if you make an appointment with a therapist, it's not a bad idea to also make an appointment with your uh, general physician as well, mm -hmm. you know, just to, to start to rule out, uh, you know, other issues that might be so. Yeah, other issues and that the mind body piece is huge and that they're both yeah. interconnected, they, they affect each other. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, it's super important. So um, what, what, what are you writing down? You're writing some notes there. Um, I don't know, I just. You're drawing? Yeah, I just, it's a habit. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking that you wanted to say something. No, 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 I just, I don't even know what I'm doing right I now. I noticed you're left-handed. Yeah, I am left-handed. Huh. Hey, um, okay, so what are some, uh, what, what, are, what do people need to know about these attacks? I don't know what, how to describe them now that I'm getting confused. Yeah, them. yeah, panic attacks. Um, well, the other thing I would assess, you asked what I would ask for, the other thing I would assess is, um, what's the so panic attacks usually last 10 minutes within 30 minutes they're usually resolved the the acute part the intense parts like 10 sometimes less than that um that's 30 minutes then in a day i, I also want to know what are they doing for the other 23 and a half hours because that matters and it influences whether or not you have them or what context you have them in and then the other pieces you mentioned is that fear of having an, another one that's actually um if we talk about the yeah on the on the mental health sort of the way that we uh, define those things there there is something called panic disorder and it's defined by the fear of having a, a panic attack sometimes people think the panic attack is the main thing but it's actually um once you've had one the constantly thinking about when it's going to happen again and trying to anticipate it and control your thinking and control your bodily reactions and then that can become problematic and oftentimes it's our effort to control the thing that becomes the the you know more of a, a problem and then avoiding situations where it might be provoked um not going to a certain place that it happened at um and that can work for a while to kind of avoid situations but then the world gets a little bit smaller and you're not able to do all the things that you could before wow so I don't know if that makes it sense. makes a lot of sense. What 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 it makes sense is why it's good to talk to a therapist. Mm -hmm. Ser seriously, just already what you were doing there is you were just kind of framing it up, kind of um, seeing seeing all the different factors. So mm -hmm. this is why it's really good for cops to talk with therapists about these kind of concerns. Also, I noticed that. Um, so I when I worked on emails, so sometimes we'd be called to people that were having these kind of events. And I, I was particularly good at calming people down, but I also recognized that they often were feeling like they were gonna die. Yeah. And that's probably another symptom because it's just so oh, frightening. Yeah, Is yeah it, it can feel like you're, and I, I think physiologically it's probably similar to an, you know, yeah. when um, the sympathetic nervous system fires up, it's your fight or flights, you, um, your body reacts as if there's an immediate threat. And it's kind of the, the uh, what's the word apex of that the height the highest yeah. the peak of of that can feel like you're you're dying um and then the parasympathetic nervous system which is the calming part um doesn't seem to kick in right away and so it can it can really feel like it, it, a sense of impending doom is often the sure. thing but it, it definitely for the person experiencing it it doesn't it's not easy to distinguish it from something actually horrible happening so are they caused by um, unattended meta mental health concerns. Like, yeah, that's, like people not like ignoring their mental health. Yeah, exactly. It's it, yeah, su suppression is the word we use. The kind of stuffing stuff down. Okay. Um, and that's why I mentioned that the piece about what what are they doing for the rest of the day? Um, because that the more your baseline anxiety creeps up, the more you're you know if you're a, always a six out of a 10 it doesn't it only takes four points to get to a, a 10 or whatever and so working on taking that down is the is one of the goals oftentimes people want to know what do i do when i have a panic attack um the bigger thing is what are you what are you doing just in general to maintain 
um, you know, being grounded, being centered, um, being as calm as you can be in, in just in general. Um, and then obviously there are some things that you can do in the moment, but the more important thing is what you're doing for the rest of the time. Right. So if a person has that experience of having a panic attack, it's really useful then to start to uh, what we might call unpack, yeah, unpack all that and see it as kind of an indication of other issues going on, mm -hmm. you know? All right. Yeah. What, um, so, so that kind of, that part's settled. If that's a part that's really good to find a, a therapist that you can just kind of explore that with. And I imagine most therapists deal with panic attacks. Is that kind of like anxiety and depression issues? Most therapists have some skills in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most do. I mean, it is a, you know, person by person to person in terms of therapists and their skill level and what they kind of do. And everybody takes a different approach. And that's the other thing is that, some things that work for one person won't work for another person. Sure. For some people, doing br specific breathing exercises can help calm them down. Other people, if they focus on their breathing, that actually makes it more yeah. intense. So, yeah, finding a good match and a good fit and a, a framework that works for the individuals is the most important. So a lot of people think of therapy as talk therapy, which it generally is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and But what's somatic work? Somatic work? Yeah, somatic work is, I actually don't do that type of work, but that's more body based and working with the, the body being much more in tune with the physiological part. Um, we do carry a ton of tension in our bodies and the more our bodies are tense, the more our mind is going to react to that. Um, the mind reacts to the body and the body reacts to the mind and that some, I think in a panic attack too, those two things, you don't even know which one started which. Yeah. Like you notice the sensation in your chest, you get more anxious, then the sensation gets tighter, and it has that kind of runaway effect. And so somatic work is doing more of that movement, I think is part of that. Um, I actually don't, it isn't my area, so I don't know it sure. a ton, but um, it is more, it's not as much about how you're thinking and talking through it, it's more working with the body. Got it, yeah, and I guess I, um, you're certainly aware of, obviously, because we've talked before about the mind-body connection and all that. Yeah. But um, somatic work just reminded me of that because I was thinking it's such a visceral experience mm -hmm. of a panic attack. You know, I, I luckily don't have, unfortunately, haven't had them. Mm -hmm. However, and I'm not, I'm not making, this kind of sounds like I'm, I'm making a joke of it. When I was in third grade, I had what I just self-diagnosed <laughs> <laughs> as a nervous breakdown and i'm it's thinking good you had it early yeah i uh, third grade i remember i came home it was a <laughs> midlife crisis <laughs> i remember i came home walked home during lunch in those days you walked home during lunch yeah and i remember telling my mom and it just starting to cascading effect and i remember as a kid the only thing I could come up with it, it was a nervous breakdown because you maybe heard that term on uh, Dick Van Dyke or some show. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It was traumatic. And I, I'm laughing about it now, but um, that's that. So well, explain. Well, yeah. I'm trying to read your note. Explain why. Why did you have a nervous breakdown? Oh, oh yeah, I should ask that. <laughs> <laughs> a therapist isn't asking. Sorry, I'm in. I was thinking about too much of it. I should lay down. Why? Uh, oh, uh, I had just, uh, I had a lot of school issues regarding uh, reading, undiagnosed reading yeah. disorder. Oh, yeah. Reading disorder. I don't know what it was. It's never been diagnosed, but school was just torturous for me when yeah. a little boy. And uh, Well, and then you're getting the wrong feedback from adults, probably. Yeah. If they don't know what it is. That's right. They, yeah. That's right. You know, and then uh, so I, I had to live in constant um, uh, hypervigilance. Uh, because of just trying to avoid getting humiliated by a spelling bee or having to read out loud in class, that type of stuff. So I was a really hyper vigilant kid. Uh, that's, am I covering it right, Tara? Well, you also switched schools. And, oh yeah, switched schools switch a lot, school, and, and, then you and I was always so I was a kid constantly. I didn't think of it till you said that, which is really good. So if you took a stress level, your baseline stress was a six, you know. So here you got a little third grader. <laughs> Yeah. Walking around, you know, looking for the wolf constantly. That's um, it, well, in the way you describe that, you would have avoid having to be humiliated or avoid certain situations. Yeah. That is very similar to that's when things become problematic. Is is when it's you're when you're looking at what's in front of you, your day or whatever, and you're like, I can't do that. I have yeah. to avoid that, and not do this, and make sure 
this person doesn't say this to me, it, then it consumes your, then that thing that lasts 10 minutes now is lasting. Right. You know, the time you're thinking about it is, is more. Well, and like, fortunately, I, I grew up in a uh, loving household. So I was able, in those days, like I said, we went home during lunch and I walked home and I remember telling my mom and, and just being a puddle. And, uh, and I remember her in desperation said to me, you don't ever have to go to school again. Wow. <laughs> and she didn't mean it or she, she was, just, or I don't know, she probably didn't have a backup plan, Take back. she but she was back. like, okay, I get it. This is a rough, yeah. you know, yeah. so, and then by the next day I'm, I'm back in it again. So. Well, that was a very understanding response. And yeah, it was yeah. very helpful. Yeah. All right. So, Good. Uh, <laughs> so you and I can say that to, you don't ever have to go back in a police car again yeah or like I don't somebody would say don't ever have to go to work yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so what else i want to get a little bit to so the idea of, i don't know if treatment's the right word but explore it see yeah. what some of maybe the root causes are look about how your life is going what you might be neglecting but not attending to all that stuff you explore um, you're gonna add something. I was just gonna say that I, I should know too. It's it is all of this is very manageable. There's yeah. a lot of stuff you can do, and it's it is normal to have these, especially high stress situations or experiences like high stress lifestyle or job yeah. or occupation, whatever that is. Um, it is it kind of comes with the territory, but there are things you can do to mitigate it, and it's about reducing the. Um, how do I say this? Reducing the like. Um, there's certain variables that lead to the thing yeah. being caused and you can work on those. Um, yeah, you can you can try to undermine it by taking care of yeah, your, great. your health in general. So I, I, I see that, um, but for the listening audience, I thought maybe what we could talk about, so we've already encouraged people to go explore that yeah. um, and pay attention to that. Um, and I will say as an aside, some people I know that have had them and just endured them for years, I'm thinking, wow, that was, you toughed it out, man. That's mm -hmm. some hard, hard stuff that people would endure in the middle of the night or whatever. And it's unfortunate because I don't know if that was necessary. In their mind, it was apparently. But um, also, maybe let's talk a little bit about people that worry that one's going to come up, what they might do. And then, too, here's something that's interesting because I talked to a friend recently that has had them in the past. He said something really interesting. He said, and you already said they last maybe 10 minutes of the intensity and maybe a 30 minutes or whatever. Um, he said, um, there's something like once that cascading effect has started, it's a matter of just enduring it. And if you knew, okay, I'm going to have to ride this out for 10, 20 minutes, but it will come to an end, you know, that seems like a mindset that would help you because if your heart's racing and all that, you're going, okay, let me do what I can to minimize the, the distress of this, but it will come to an end. I have to just ride this thing out. Am I, is that making yeah, sense? Yeah, there's a subtle distinction between like white knuckling it, which is not good, but um, riding it, surfing it or whatever okay. you want to call it. The, there's a phrase um, that's, uh, yeah, it, it, in acceptance and commitment therapy that when you're on the train, you can't like you should just choose to ride it because it's okay you're on it no matter yeah. what. like you yeah. can't get off the train so you're you're going for a ride and if you can kind of go with it obviously you want to make sure you're safe not driving sure. these sorts of things so you know making sure you are not in harm's way and it is important too to to note that um it, we're talking about it when there's not an immediate threat to somebody right the, yeah. a panic attack so not in a situation where there is high intensity stuff going on but um, when there's no immediate concern and the anxiety is still there, the panic is there. Um, yeah, because if you are in a situation that's, you know. what are you, are you differentiating when the anxiety would be related to a real bad event in the moment? And that's yeah. appropriate, so to speak? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. So panic, panic attacks. Too. I mean, it's, there's otherwise it's disproportionate to uh, your situation. Yeah. So, yeah. And usually the, the stuff that people report or they talk about or when they have something that's unprovoked like okay or we say it's unprovoked sometimes oftentimes there is something that provokes it which is another thing you can learn in therapy yeah um learn what the triggers are what okay the context is that leads to it um yeah because yeah. you could see where someone to take it out of the police world could say every time they go to their um family gathering every time they see that one family member they don't like they get you know you could see where they could anticipate Mm -hmm. a conflict or something like that yeah 
Okay. Yeah, and it kind of sets the stage for it to be more likely then. Right? Oh, if you're okay. if you're already gearing up to to prepare for some sort of interaction or problem, then it sort of gets you in that that mindset. So then that's going to be the self talk and the calming techniques and. Yeah, and there's uh, the word mindfulness is not I'm not a huge fan of it because it's just the way that it's used nowadays. But there is a, definitely a practice of um, stepping back from the contents of your thinking of yeah. all the language and the words and the thoughts and images and all that stuff that's constant the constant stream of information in our our minds there are practices you can do to um gain a little bit of distance from them so that they're you're not as reactive just to internal things that are happening if that makes sense it does yeah so what when you i, I agree with you on the mindfulness well i don't like anything that's too trendy that's right, right. i can't stand yeah. the word but attention what? training is maybe a better word interesting where you put your attention yeah that's interesting yeah and being able to know like a practice of noticing um and noticing how, how quickly we get sucked into mm -hmm. things in our mind and it's a strange thing that human beings react to we can react to language in our or thoughts in our head in, in a similar way that we, we would react to an actual right. thing that's happening like uh um you know being attacked by an animal or something there are thoughts that people have that provoke the same response as actually their life being threatened it's just it's kind of an interesting thing that only human beings it's fascinating have that. i mean the one one analogy or one story you could tell is you you go into your shed to grab something and there's suddenly there's a snake there and you have this extreme reaction and you can actually picture the snake leaping at you or whatever a snake does and um and then then you reflect a moment later go well, actually i think that may have been the garden hose you know, but you had that actual experience if it was a real snake and how quickly you can get into that animal brain. Yeah. Another thing, I guess here's something I'd like to insert, and that is the idea that you don't have to live with whatever just falls into your head is one thing. And also the maybe mindfulness is also adding a, um, a layer of thought between one thought and the automatic next thought. Exactly. Yeah. And even being able to notice what is going through because we oftentimes mistake the stuff in our head as as being reality when mm -hmm. it's really just a it's a what's the phrase don't mistake the map for the territory or something hmm. and um so we're creating a, a model of the world in our heads and oftentimes we're reacting to that and not the situation that's in front of us and that's uh, a lot of the time with anxiety or panic that is what we're doing we're anticipating something or um reacting to our own thinking and not the actual situation so the more you can get into the the this situation um, that's happening now to get into the present moment and to be responding to what's actually happening and not you're thinking about it, um, then you're, you know, less stressed out usually. Great. Well, what if you were to use, uh, um, it's not as clever of a term as mindfulness, but uh, at attention or reattending or adjusting, uh, adjusting your attention what kind of practices do you do or do you suggest what, what are sort of the range of things um there that fall under the category of mindfulness i guess yeah i mean it's so different for every person um doing some i mean it can be as simple as having a cup of coffee in the morning and just doing that and experiencing drinking a cup of coffee that's oftentimes a, a good starting point um not doing 15 other things and just doing that one thing doing it and paying attention to it, how it tastes, using all of your senses to, um, you know, take in information of what's happening now. That helps to get us into the present moment. Um, my dad is a big tractor enthusiast and he's a hunter. That's how he does it. I mean, if I told my dad to go practice mindfulness, he'd be like, what is that <laughs> bullshit? But if, um, but then he turns his farm all on in the shed and sits and listens to it for two hours. Yeah. He's doing the same thing. Yeah. Like noticing the the way that the engine, ma you know, makes a certain noise and he can distinguish it from a John Deere and he likes this sound and that. That's his version of that. Or sitting in a, a deer stand, just paying attention. Um, that's what I think of mindfulness. Not like a, you know, namaste, sitting cross-legged mm -hmm. or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that. but um, Those are cool practices, yeah. but I'm really glad you gave the example of your dad, the tractor hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, even that coffee one was really good because what we might be tempted to do is be on our phone while we're drinking coffee which is that's something that i'm trying to practice constantly of the phone is another variable that's being thrown into the yeah. thing that's caught that causes a lot of problems even no so 
an example of mindfulness would be noticing how often you have the urge to reach for your phone uh -huh. because there's always something that provokes that. Uh, even for me, I'm, I might feel like a little bit uncomfortable with something and then I go to reach for my phone. I don't even notice that I'm doing it, but 20 minutes later, I'm, you know, looking at some stupid thing and I feel terrible afterwards. But if you can even pay attention to your, your urges to do uh, a thing to, and we're often trying to avoid distressing stuff. And, um, the phrase is experiential avoidance. It's pretty mm -hmm. simple, but just avoiding discomfort, avoiding things that cause stress. Um, that's never a good, I shouldn't say that sometimes it's a good thing. There, there are situations where you want to avoid certain things, but oftentimes when we avoid things, then it just, um, gives them more power. Um, I, was, that makes sense. I can illustrate that with an, with an ex, uh, short story. And that is one time I was driving and, uh, I went to turn the radio on music radio on, and I went to turn it on and I noticed it was already on. Now I like to listen to talk radio. And I, I thought, well, that's interesting. I went to turn the radio on and it was already on. And I've done that before. So I, I had kind of been experimenting with this already. And I started thinking, hmm, what was I thinking about or trying not to think about? Mm -hmm. and, and I reflected on it because it occurred to me that I may have been trying to distract myself from my thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to have some noise or racket. And I realized I, I'm not sure, but I think I was probably anxious about something. Mm -hmm. And so in that anxiety, it occurred to me that I didn't like my thoughts or I wanted to avoid them or get a new thought. So I was turn the radio on, even though it was already on. I mean, it was just a, a point of reflection for me that I realized sometimes uh, it's best just to let uncomfortable thoughts and emotions have their say so they can kind of come and go and or just sit with them temporarily um, so they can have their say versus trying to push them down, avoid them and all that. Because sometimes they just simply want to have their say. They want to be noted, I guess. That's exactly it. Yeah, they knock at the door until you yeah. see who's there. Um, and we, the, part of it too is how good we are at solving problems, human beings. Um, we're able to solve a ton of problems in our physical environment. I think that's where the problem solving language process came from with in, uh, in terms of why we have that, it's for solving really complex problems. And if there's a problem in a physical space, like uh, an example I've heard before is you smell something, you evaluate the situation. I don't like the smell. I, I feel disgust. So then you, you evaluate, you search, you assess, you find out that the garbage, something is in the garbage. Um, and you think, I don't like that thing. I need to get rid of it. So then you tie up the garbage and take it out. Um, you've identified a problem, you evaluated it assess the situation, and then you use problem solving to get rid of the, the problem. Um, that works really well in the physical environment, but internally it, it goes haywire because you can't get rid of things in your mind. Um, one of the thought experiments about that is a pretty simple one. It's, it's, um, it's like if, if, if I were to give you a million dollars for you to cross the street without thinking about a red car, you can't, no one can win mm -hmm. that because your effort to not think about the car makes you think more about the car. And the harder you try not to think about something, the longer it stays around. So yeah. sometimes allowing it to pass through is the best thing you can do um, because every effort you make to, to not think about something is just thinking more about it. Right, and sense. the problem becomes not the, the red car or the thought or even the distressing thought, it's your efforts to avoid it mm -hmm. become the thing yeah. you know you brought it up and and i thought of this uh, this seems profound to me the whole idea that um discomfort mental emotional discomfort is our friend in a sense that it sometimes it's something that needs attention and it's it is coming into your attention you know mm -hmm. and and you can relate to this you know a small ch a new baby is going to keep crying until they're attended to yeah and and they're going to continue until they're attended to. Um, and sometimes I think of our, our distressing mental, emotional thoughts. Sometimes it's easy to think of a nightmare or a distressing mental, emotional thought as something against you, not on your side. But actually, it, some, it occurs to me that it often is a wise part of yourself trying to move you to a better state of mind. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Yeah, there's, it's feedback. It's, it's information that can be useful to you. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
Let's see here. Oh, you also brought up map. I'm, I, I don't, it may a little bit disconnect, but I've already started here. Sure. Um, <laughs> we're friends. Yeah, we're, we're, both of us are fans of Jordan Peterson, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with him. Familiar with yeah. him, I guess. And he, um, I'll say I'm a big fan. And he, um, he was, you were talking about maps of the world kind of thing. And I saw something him by the other day that was saying, and this, I think police officers can relate to this, is our map of the world keeps changing. Um, because, you know, post Ferguson, like, wow, I didn't realize this, how people viewed the cops. And then, uh, and then it, it appears now in our present state, especially locally, maybe is it's that's that it, that's become even more intense. And so for cops are having to continuously update their their map of the world. It was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And and that's necessary, you know. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the OK, what can you tell me about grounding techniques? Is that a term you talk about? Is that a skill that a uh, person that has panic attacks? I, I can describe what I understand them to be. Yeah, sure. And I, I would love to hear some of the ones that you've, you've picked up or learned as well. But basically getting yourself grounded, it, it has a it's a, the word does kind of help explain it itself. Um, but really, I mean, feeling yourself connected to your body, what's happening now to the moment. Um, sometimes something as simple as like literally um, touching an object or like the chair that I'm sitting on and, and yeah. noticing that, noticing my, where I'm contacting it, um, feeling myself in my body where I'm sitting or how my feet are on the ground and yeah. feeling connected and centered in that way. Um, yeah, there's, there's different ones you can do, but oftentimes it, it involves a, a physical connection to something in the environment or your own. Oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. And I, I just heard, I picked these up and I've had officers call me when they are in a panic attack. And it was easier on the ambulance when I would be with a person, you know, mm -hmm. and then also, too, you'd be taking their blood pressure and sitting them down, giving my whatever you do. But over the phone, it's a little more difficult. And then it occurred to me that is if a person's having a panic attack or anxiety attack, soothing and supportive words are only are, are limited in their usefulness because mm -hmm. they're already kind of in this i might die i feel like i'm going to die thing so i've often thought about gosh is there something physical that person could do and then i started to look into it and, and actually people would tell me about it and i don't know if they discovered them spontaneously but i know some people have said when i've had them if i sit down on the floor and push my back up against the wall yeah interesting or if i'm driving and i can feel it come on i'll pull over and i'll i'll uh, push myself down into the seat and f grip the wheel. And I'm just wondering if it's almost like bringing you more into your body Absolutely. and a little out of your brain. And I don't know if this fits, but it just occurred to me when I was a paramedic, I'd start IVs on people, right? And it's a, it's a needle you stick in their hand or their arm and it can be painful. And some people have a lot of anxiety about it. And a little trick I learned often when I would do it is we'd, we'd clean the air and get prepped and they'd be staring at the needle. And I could see their body start to tense and I'd say, take a breath. I would simply say, cue them to take a breath. They would take a breath and right in the midst of that breath, I would insert the needle. It was, mm -hmm. and I think what it was is it just broke this kind of tension cycle and it got them back into their body because when they were staring at the needle, they were totally into their fear brain, I guess. Yeah. Or and, something, I don't know, something like that. No, I think that's right. And that's the thing where each person I think can, should and can find their the thing that works best for them because you, you mentioned pressure some people do really like a lot of intense pressure almost doing wall sits or pushing against something um or some people do the breathing piece and I, it really is a, a matter of finding that tool that works best for the for the person well the breathing makes sense too because the breathing for those that are into that mind body connection the breathing is not it really is a what would you like a bridge between the two yeah it, and uh, with with breathing too, oftentimes we then we hold too much carbon dioxide, and then that fuels anxiety. Um, and so, some people will find it helpful to take a like a there's something called the, I think it's four two six sure. breathing or something where you you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for two, you breathe out for six, yeah. so that you're expelling more carbon dioxide, taking more oxygen. Oh, interesting. Physiologically, that that does tend to work really well, but for some people focusing too much on breathing makes them be like, I can't do it right. And I'm and like, they 
for some people it works really good for some people they actually get a little bit more heightened yeah. by trying to control yeah. the breathing and then another one that somebody told me the other day was um to try to localize the the distress in your body to find out where it's it, where it, it's physically located or, or most noticeable and then to put a hand on on that place or both hands and, and give a little bit of pressure and then to kind of breathe into that spot um sometimes it's helpful to localize it in the body otherwise it feels like this sort of chaotic diffuse thing yeah, yeah exactly so you you sort of centralize it and then breathe into it um and that that can help too and then there's a, a thing um i'm not a medical person so i might get this wrong but i actually experienced it that's why i remember it um i think it's called costochondritis but the, it's like an inflammation in the joints or some sort of connective tissue that does actually feel like something squeezing your chest or running down your arm mm -hmm. or whatever that is um and it goes throughout your upper body and that's that's another thing uh, just another piece to it too yeah. that the body can get tense in many different ways so then they're having that to me what you're describing they have cardiac symptoms yeah and, and that's what's and, and you can imagine the cascading effect of that oh my god i'm having a heart attack and now i have to call an ambulance or go to the er mm -hmm. and you probably know this as well uh a lot People that have anxiety or panic attacks um, often end up in the ER yeah. and get cardiac symptoms ruled out. Yeah, and that's part of the whole learning process for them, you know. Yeah, and I would say in the moment, if it is that you know pain in the chest, down the arm, it is best to go get it. You know, yeah. make no, sure I you say nah. It. <laughs> <laughs> it roll the dice. Yeah, no, roll the dice. <laughs> no, you're right about that. Um, so let's see. Anything else you think we should talk about regarding this topic? So here, one thing I just want to review is that um, it's all, it's about your whole health and well-being. Yeah. Um, so that everyone can benefit from working on that. Um, you can, the other 23 and a half hours you should look at and yeah. explore. You might learn some skills about how you're managing your life well and not so well to decrease the risk and also you might have some physical issues that you should explore as well and then um if you feel they were coming on did we talk about so in the midst of it one is to know that you might just have to write it out but it's gonna it's limiting mm -hmm. um and then we talked a little bit about the whole uh, grounding techniques which to me means if anyone's concerned about this for themselves or others, they can explore it, learn yeah. more about it. Yeah, Google and yep. read find something that works. exactly. Yeah. And and because who wants to live with that fear that suddenly you might fall over and lose your ability to function? You know. Yep. Um, did we talk a little bit about if you if they people felt them coming on, what they might do? Um, or is that did we already? Well, that is that is one thing that oftentimes comes if you've had one, then you become more sensitive to the internal sensations and the, and the physical stuff. I think it, it does depend, and that's why working, um, working with somebody to look at the context, the situations, when it happens, and so on and so forth. Um, but m for a lot of people, I would talk about uh, a practice of noticing and accepting those feelings um, and being make, kind of making space for them, like you were saying earlier, of allowing them to be there. Um, but it does depend on where you are, what's what you're supposed to be doing in ten minutes or fifteen, or sure. you know, if you're on the job. There's so there's other factors there. But I my kind of go-to thing is just having a um, a more accepting or, or willing attitude towards it of yeah. of being able to allow it into your experience. And then oftentimes you see an ironic thing where that then leads to things calming down mm -hmm. when you're more willing to have it um because the less you're willing to have it the more you're guaranteed to get it yeah and you're it. fighting against it and yeah yeah interesting and then I, I would say quick too that we didn't i don't know if we mentioned it but the the diet piece is huge too and like if you drink a, a pot of coffee a day you're that's going to increase the likelihood of it happening okay you know, anything energy that's, drinks and stuff yeah yeah stimulants all of that just it, it doesn't mean it'll give someone panic attacks but it does raise their i mean it, it's it, all of that is is impacting the uh sympathetic nervous system sure. and kind of gearing you up with more adrenaline and cortisol and all that kind of stuff yeah maybe lower their threshold for it exactly yeah. okay well anything that makes a lot of sense a stimulant will do that yeah okay all right anything more on that topic uh i mean there's 
probably many tangents, but uh, no, I think that's okay. unless you have any other. No, I don't. Know. I just I just want to. I want to do something useful for the listeners is what I guess. Absolutely. All right. Um, hey, uh, do you have any, so you did a ride along with me when you were, you and some other staff member were coming on. Do you have any good memories of that? I don't think we did anything too interesting. Um, it was, what was it like, I mean, and you've done it maybe before because you've worked with other agencies. What was it like riding yeah, along? Is yeah, that, I've done, I've done like three or four, I think, and actually, yeah, a couple close friends that are police officers and went with one of them um on two i think um it was it, it, very interesting especially just the being with you and the relationships that you've developed with people in the community and being able to i know we stopped a few times we were able to talk to to different figures in the area and there was a lot going on um that was really cool to me to see that relationship building just and, with the public or with cops was what, yeah i mean it was both yeah. I, I know we stopped at a church and you talked to a pastor or, or one of the leaders there um and then a couple of other guys that were in the area and yeah. it seemed like you knew them and anything surprising about when you see cops working you know about how they do their job um anything surprising well here I, that was that wasn't a fair way to do it what i was at um people that aren't cops probably imagine when cops get together i don't know what they imagine but where I work, when cops get together, where it's, whether it's training or uh, locker room talk or other things, they're really, really lively and oh, yeah. good spirited and friendly and yeah. funny and um, and actually often very nice to each other. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah good sense of humor. Yeah. And very welcoming to me. And it, that felt, yeah, it felt good and yeah. easy, easy, very easy to connect with people. Yeah. And I have noticed that doing the work, too, that um, once trust is there, it's I mean, you don't want to, there's no stereotyping, but um, the cops that I've worked with, once there's trust there, they open up just like anybody else and mm -hmm. they're willing to talk about whatever. And it's just that, you know, having that, being able to, to build that connection with, mm -hmm. with somebody. Yeah. yeah, good for you. Um, let's see, how about, uh, you know, you and I have talked about, I think, and I know you have some interest in this, is the whole um, area of post-traumatic stress disorder and the emerging field of medical medicine assisted treatments do you have yeah. any com thoughts any comments about that yeah well i would mention too that just the the trauma piece and the panic attacks do those there is a point where those obviously overlap or yeah. inter interconnect um the more ad adverse life experiences you have or the repeated intense high intensity situations that's going to raise the likelihood of that okay that happening um but yeah i'm, I'm so should I talk a little bit about my history with that or sure. work in that area? So, um, Ben, I've been fascinated with psychedelics for a really long time and their potential. Um, did a lot of reading on the historical research that existed in the early 1900s into the really until the 1960s, and then obviously there was a um, a huge halt to most of that for quite a few decades. Um, and now it's things are starting to kind of turn around, and there's a renaissance in the field. Um, so when I was younger, I didn't think that these things would be legal for medical use and found out they were a few years ago. And so I got a certificate from the California Institute for Integral Studies um, as a, I think the certificate is called psychedelic assisted. I think it's just called, I think I'm a certified psychedelic assisted psychotherapist. <laughs> I, I don't know what the, there's some acronym, but, right. but basically went through the training to be able to provide the um, therapy side of that. And, uh, Right now, um, a substance called MDMA is in the last phase of, of research, and um, MAPS the, is the agency doing that, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, I think, or science, one okay. of the two. Um, but MDMA is being, they're, right now in the research, they're treating post-traumatic stress and um, pretty intense trauma, oftentimes um, folks coming from or who were in uh, Iraq in the, in the Middle East um, and were in active combat. Um, and that's in the last phase of, of research. And when, assuming that the results are good, that will force the DEA to, or the FDA will then approve it as a therapy and the DEA will then reschedule it so that it's available for medical use. And that's something that we're, I'm planning to be okay. involved well, in. Okay, well, let me see if I can catch the listeners up a little bit. And that is what we might, what I think we're talking about is um, pure forms of what we recognize as like ecstasy, 
yeah. ketamine, maybe even mushrooms and such. Yeah, so there's different, different, and which is really kind of, for lack of better terms, triggering for cops who are mostly Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts that are going, whoa, whoa, those are illegal drugs that, yeah, you know, we 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 view as crimes, but they're pure forms that are administered in very extremely regimented ways to maybe access or bypass certain therapeutic or engage certain therapeutic processes that are, I think you told me, uh, I hope I have this right, that you were at a conference where they were revealing some of the success with this. And you said the therapists were just joyful, like this is why we became therapists, to have these kinds of uh, results from, I mean, it was so encouraging to them. Yeah, it was, correct? yeah, we, we did a, as part of the training, we did a, a retreat um, and we were able to watch some of the therapy that was carried out. And it was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a very powerful experience for everybody that was there. And it is very different when these um, substances are used in a therapeutic context. It's not like recreationally using sure. them. They are very pure. Um, and most of the time when people do ecstasy or molly, um, it's almost always got something else in it that's not good for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they, there's a huge therapeutic potential for them when it's done in a very safe setting with a physician and a therapist there. Sure. Um, and MDMA in particular is showing extremely good results for um, working with trauma. And it's because it somehow, um, it puts somebody in a very relaxed state where their body is completely calm and memories and sensations and, and sensations and experiences related to trauma are able to come into their experience without them reacting in a very scared or that strong make, that way. That makes so much sense because if they don't feel that they have to protect themselves from harm necessarily, like immediate physical risk, because they're calmed and in a safe environment with a physician, that maybe accesses or makes more available those mental processes that you want to alter or think work on, huh? Yeah, that's exactly it. And anytime there's a high intensity situation where your life is at risk, um, because of some processes that happen in the brain, the memories oftentimes aren't consolidated. It's like a file cabinet yeah. where we store memories. When there's a in high intensity situation, um, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, essentially like it, it sort of closes down or, or something yeah. like that, if you will, so that the memories can't get put in the filing cabinet. Right. So then you have these scattered memories all over the right. place. You got these files laying around, some are unlabeled, some are in yeah. the wrong air And then spot. You, you stumble across them yeah. and it feels like it's happening again because yeah. you don't actually know that it's a memory. It feels like it's taking place again. And so with MDMA, it's basically a process of getting in a calm state and then, you know, putting the files back in the Five, well, okay. and, and just uh, to reassure everyone a little bit is those processes were designed for our survival, right? That mm -hmm. you would remember something, you'd hit a, a snap of a twig, you might associate with a, a creature coming up behind you, and that's intended that way. However, they don't, when it turns out it isn't that, you want to process that normally. And for some people, a, a word that maybe that works with psychological trauma is they feel stuck like that. They're, they're re-experiencing the original intense emotion uh, away from the real risk. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and you're right that all of it is, is very adaptive, all of those systems, yeah. One, um, uh, Ronnie, what was I thinking about? You were talking about, oh, um, the different meds. I lost my train of thought. Do you, you have a note, Terry? What do you think about EMDR? I mean, and oh, how that's right. Let me, let me. This to EMDR? Okay, sure. let's come back to that because yeah. that's the guy actually. Thanks, Terry. I was thinking, um, I think you and I talked about this. And part of the reason I think this is exciting is EMDR that we're familiar with is the smooth eye movement therapy to access a part of the brain, help process through trauma. Um, that may have ancient history in a sense of both drumming or running uh, could some of these things that we're talking about, even these um, drug-assisted therapies, they could be ancient. I don't know if ancient's the right word, but they're re bringing back things that worked maybe centuries ago. Oh yeah, yeah, people have, it, well, in terms of the, the medicine side of it, people have used these things for a super long time. I mean, tens of thousands of years, evidence of people using them um, to, 
to restore that sense of balance, of connection, of community, all these different things. Um, and I do think, yeah, that's a, that's a, the philosophy part of that, of the, the history is it's super interesting to think about, but I, I really do think um, that is why those things, these things emerged with human beings in early um, like tribal settings um, because they were medicines that helped to, you know, the, deal with the challenges of, mm -hmm of of life um and the, the things that are unique to the human being um because we're animals don't if animals experience something really intense um they problem solve it in the moment and then if something reminds them of that they'll they've learned how to avoid it but human beings as soon as we experience something like that we then run through all of these different scenarios of risk um, what's the risk of this? What's the risk of that? And so you, yeah. and we have infinite possibilities of thinking about all the things and the problems that could, could happen. Um, and that can kind of run, well, that can run wild. Maybe is that where rumination comes in? Yeah. I, and yeah, I think for some people it's, it, it depends on the context, but I definitely, and, or obsessive anxiety. Cause, um, cause yeah. we, were we were talking earlier how maybe healthy, healthy and useful it is to let certain thoughts and emotions just have their say. That's different. Like you even described the difference between white knuckling a problem and all that. That's also different than what I think some people get is where they ruminate, maybe a a, a, what, a feedback loop that they can't seem to get out of, mm -hmm. you know, with obsessive thoughts or whatever. So, yep. you know, I guess uh, two conclusions that I'm coming to talking to you. One is it's really good for cops to talk with a therapist because therapists are skilled, not all, but people like you and your colleagues are really skilled with, you just know about this stuff and you can help them through it and all that. And also there's room to just explore it yourself, to have a positive attitude about your distressing experiences and that you can get good help for it, whether it's your own reading or study or talking or the therapeutic help. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be touchy-feely, that the kind of, um, yeah, I think sometimes the, impression people get or the thought in their head is that it's going to be somebody that's like, tell me how you feel. Right. Uh-huh. Mm, yeah. And, and just doing that. And, and really the, there's a lot of, um, problem or solution focused yeah. therapies yeah. that are strategy based and, and we can actually work on applying certain strategies to, to resolve. Things. I think you're a good example. I did know she had a knife in your pocket. Oh yeah. You caught that. Wow. Yeah. So that you're just, you're not just a touchy feely therapist. Type. Oh yeah, no, I always carry. I actually I accidentally cut myself today. With it. Oh really? Yeah, because yeah, you were playing with a knife. Well, I got a new one, and I was op I opened it in the car. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, funny. I had um, I was like unpacking. It. I remember. So I have three kids, and then the first two were like no, 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 you know, on everything, and then. I remember our middle boy wanted a knife and like, I didn't want him to have a knife. You know, I had to hide on matches from him and all that stuff because, you know, and then my youngest, we were uh, at scout camp and um, I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll loosen up the grip on this stuff. I'll get him a knife, you know? <laughs> and um, within minutes, he's got a suturable cut on his oh, hand, no. poor little guy. And, um, and I remember my middle boy was like, yeah, you know, why'd you do? You know, why, why did you like suddenly loosen up all the rules on knives, you know, and I kind of over dumb story. But anyway, it involved blood in the knife. So no, that's, that's I've had there. plenty of those. Yeah. Yeah. We used to collect them when we were little and I just always carry one. So what collect my, knives? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My dad. Uh, yeah. Let us do some pretty dangerous yeah. stuff. Thank God. That's cool. Driving cars and motorcycles. And stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah. You're also a hunter, I know. Yeah, well, to... yeah, archery. I actually am sort of, I never did it much when I was younger. My dad's a huge bow hunter. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to be going this year for sure. Got my grandpa's bow. My grandpa died a couple of years ago, and so we got his bow fitted for me, and I'm going to take it out. It's kind of a cool, cool way to, you know, pay tribute or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Oh, man. That's why I like you so much, because you kind of have this... Uh... Well, I like you a lot because you work with our officers, all right? I like you a lot for that. And um, because I really need that help, I need the good, skilled therapist. And um, I like uh, your soulfulness kind of stuff. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but you value those things. Mm -hmm. And another thing I like, we, you and I have talked quite a bit about um, Stoic philosophy. Mm -hmm. So let me just do a commercial quick, and then we'll come back to that or anything else that might come to mind. Okay. So here's the commercial. Um, 
If you enjoyed this podcast, you might be interested in my book. It's called Good Cop, Good Cop, a Get Healthy, Stay Healthy Guide for Law Enforcement. I cover um, some of the topics we've talked about today. Um, the book is in print or audio book, and you can be, it can be purchased through Amazon. You can also find out more information about me or the podcast or Blue Watch Officer Wellness Training, etc. at goodcopgoodcop.com. Let's see. Anything that you were thinking we might talk about that I we haven't I haven't brought up yet coming over here? No, I don't think I think it's with all these there's so much complexity it's hard not to get off on tan tangents because yeah. I know I'm thinking yeah, I could go What's your so favorite much. tangent in the world? Tangent? Oh. I mean I'm the meaning of things is always fascinating to me. The meaning and then the evolutionary history of it or the um yeah, just looking at why things are the way that they are. I'm constantly fascinated by that. Yeah. Wow, so the meaning of things. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't even know exactly what I, exactly what I mean by that. But well, you, pursue, you pursue it or you're curious about the meaning of things or maybe yeah. you need that for your own kind of sense of well-being? Yeah, constantly. Yeah, yeah. So I think by that, I mean the philosophy, the history of it. Um, I'm just fascinated by human beings and how we think about things and what they how how things um obtain meaning or, or have meaning for us um and we're meaning making creatures and so it's i think that's one of the most important things to look at is what is what is somebody's core values what what do they feel gives their life meaning because those are the things that we can really tune into um when things get tough in particular um i love the quote by uh nietzsche that's i think it's a uh, he who has a why to live for can endure mm -hmm. almost any how. Right. Um, so it's just always fascinates me what makes people tick or why do they, why do they do what they do? And I think for in therapy, that's um, and, unless we're just doing practical problem solving. Uh, a lot of the therapy I do is about that of what's um, what gives somebody a sense of purpose and how do we make more of that or, or deepen that connection, even in spite of things that might be, um, you know, rattling that a little bit. Well, I would think that what you're describing there would be very useful to working with police officers. Yeah, I think it's been part of the conversation I've had with, with um, several folks that I've been working with. Of it, it, Yeah, that loss of meaning or threat to meaning is, is huge. And I think it's in the, obviously in the profession, a lot of things coming up there. But then just in society in general, there's a, a crisis of meaning and a loss of meaning. And we do all sorts of things to compensate for that or to deal with it. Um, some not so healthy and some, you know, the other way. Well, but it's also, you were just, uh, this fits in with you saying you've had your grandfather's bow refitted for you. I mean, so you're just going to be handling some, an object that has meaning to you because of your, your grandfather. I mean, and yeah, that's to me an example of cultivating meaning and, and, uh, and all that so. yeah that's exactly it because in reality it's just a it's just an object but it yeah well that, but you also said i think you said assign meaning it's something like that that's really interesting too because people will assign meaning to things that are otherwise meaningless maybe um but that's a perfect example we assign meaning to inanimate objects mm -hmm. well and then to relationships to conversations to what people say like it mm -hmm. it pervades everything because really yeah, we're co we're constantly interpreting information that's coming into our experience, and each of us makes sense of, of it in a different way. Um, and I think that's where a lot of misunderstanding comes from, and, and then conflict um, ultimately as well is that we're we mean different things, and we're saying, or we might mean the same thing, but yeah. the way that you hear what I mean is different than what I sure. intended, and so, so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of a lot of things are just huge misunderstandings, and people really you know, can, wow. can align on things if we can have a conversation. I think that I maybe uh, error in thinking that people, everyone values meaning a lot like I do. So I assume that they are, and I'm, I'm not so sure they do. I'm sure some people, I don't know if pe some people are just aren't into, I don't know. Do you think it's a universal thing that people desire meaning? Yeah, I think that some people just don't know what they, or it get, they they um, they assign it to something that won't ever fulfill them. You know, like buying things or trying to um, fill a hole with more 
products yeah. and goods and things. You know, right. you never. Oh, that's so good. Never actually attain the thing you're looking for because you actually want something else, but you think it's. If I just get another new thing, and then another what's that thing. phrase? Uh, There's nothing worse than almost enough. <laughs> Oh, I think wow, it's an addiction. Really it's an addiction thing. Yeah, uh, where people are like ah, because you're uh, people in, in addiction are chasing that high, but you can never get to that. <clears throat> Partly, it could mean even the original excitement of being a cop or, or those things. You can never get to that again, and you end up chasing that. That's exactly it. And the with the phones and social media, that's all of that plays on our our need for that, but in a way that doesn't fulfill us. So we keep doing. Well, more and, and that tied up even better, maybe that phone and all those distractions are because we don't want to s calm down and let our thoughts catch up with us because they're distressing. Mm -hmm. And maybe they just need to. Yeah. And we, So uh, to tie this up a little bit, is there, we covered a, a couple topics, but a couple of them are, what, are what the uh, panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And it was also the... Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or psychological trauma and the potential for other maybe uh, new developing treatments for that. <clears throat> Sorry. If someone had either of those conditions and were more, had some curiosity about getting help, any advice, the next step for them? Um, well, I mean... So for our officers, let me just say that, yeah. for our St. Paul officers, they can call me and we can... Uh, we can get the help for psychological trauma and any panic attacks. Yeah. Um, for other listeners, I'll just leave that one to you. Any... Yeah, I mean, I think for finding a provider, do do research and um, and feel it out. I think with therapy, I always recommend find somebody that you feel like is in the area that you're looking for. Also, see if you feel like they might be a good connection in terms of their personality and how they write, what they say, and so on and so forth. And then give it three times and see if it's a good good connection with them. And if it's not a good connection and you don't feel un understood, then you can try working with somebody else. Um, and then uh, did you ask about the other treatment too? The, the, the drug-assisted one? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the right term. Yeah, because I don't think that's ready. Yet. Yeah, and there's a ton to say about I, I think we, we the, you know, we jumped, I kind of jumped into that one midstream, but there's a ton of, ton more information about it and the history and what it's used for and the incredible results that are coming out uh, from it, which is the, um, in the phase two, I think it was 68% of people no, no longer met the criteria one year after treatment. And that's the type of treatment that is uh, only, it's, it's time limited. It's only a few times and, and you don't have to necessarily go do it again after you've Amazing. completed the course of it. Um, and there's a, the organization called MAPS. Yeah, so why don't you give that, inf what, uh, so it's M-A-P-S stands for what? It's the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And if you, if you Google like MAPS and then the word psychedelics, they'll. So I was actually exploring it, looking at their website and thought, darn, I wish we had a therapist locally that had some experience with that. Yeah. And I come across your damn face. <laughs> That's already after we knew each other, right? Yeah. You yeah. Were, you're already one of our contracted therapists. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Yes. And so we're in the in the process of, of developing a program um, so that we can carry out that work. And right now, uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy is the one that's currently legal and available. So we're starting there. Um, and the plan is to do work with MDMA, MDMA, and then um, psilocybin once that comes down the road. Great. So um, let's talk about, can you just say a few things about LA Family Services? Yeah. Um, Do you so, want the listeners to know? Yeah, LA Family Services, we're a mental health agency that's been around since 2015. Um, we have several locations across the metro. Um, we have so a, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yeah, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Sorry, I got it back. Yeah, so. and then I don't know if I can name <laughs> them all. Lakeville, Woodbury. We're opening one in Edina. We got one in Coon Rapids, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Mendota Heights. Um, Mendota Heights, thank you. <laughs> St. Paul, you said that. Yeah. Minneapolis, okay. So I know there's a, yeah, Chaska, Bloomington, that was the other one. Yeah. So, yeah, so we do um, a variety of mental health services. One of the things that's um, unique to us is that we, well, one is we take kind of a no BS approach to, to doing therapy. We encourage our therapists to just be real with people and not try to hide behind a title or a, a license or a credential mm -hmm. or whatever that is. 
um, and to do good work. And then we have people that do individual work, work with children, work with adults, work with couples and entire family systems, which is definitely takes a, a specialist type person to do family systems work. And we have people that can do all of those things. So we can be, we try to be kind of a one-stop shop for people and families. And if we're not a good fit, we have good partners in the community that we refer to. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else. No, that's level. good. It's really useful for our agency. And another benefit is um, I have other public safety groups asking for me to help them find therapists and that overwhelm me. Um, so having Ellie Family Services in your, what would I call your expandability, right? That's really been useful for us. So. Yeah, and we have a growing team of providers who do um, work with law enforcement and first responders. It, it's, right now it's about 20 clinicians who can, each one has a different specialty, so a different focus and some are family and some are individual, but we, we have a, a growing group of people um, to do this work and we're working on constantly getting um, better training and you know conversations and learning from, right. from you and other people in the community. What's too. the website? I, Terry will put it in the notes, but is it L-E- yeah, it's elliefamilyservices.com, okay. and Ellie is spelled E-L-L-I-E. -E. We yeah. do, though, uh, I, th I don't know if it was after you told me that about the Ellie thing, but we actually have a f flyer specifically for police departments yeah. that says Ellie at Ellie. Yeah. So, oh, I like it. Good, on that. good job. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, let's see here. So th I want to make sure I, I, I've failed to do this in the past. Thank Terry for being the producer of the Cop yeah, Thing thank podcast. You. And Owen for being the um, techno guy. And then, um, Terry, any thoughts before we end here? Because I know these subjects are kind of interesting to you, too. Really good. Okay. So um, we gave that. So I just want to thank everyone for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, that's it for now. And uh, go back to work. Mm -hmm.